Come on. Hey, let me encourage you to pull out your, pull out your phones. Take notes. Grab your Bibles. We're going to dive straight into God's Word. Anybody come hungry for God's Word? Awesome. That was 12 of you. Come on. Let's try that one more time. Anybody come hungry for God's Word? Where you at? All right. I'm telling you, I'm going to need you today. All right. Let's kick this thing off right. If you're taking notes, if you got your Bible, turn with me to James chapter 4. And I want you to put a bookmark in Psalms 23. I'm going to get there in just a moment. James chapter 4 and Psalms chapter, chapter 23. I want to go ahead and give you, I usually like to read scripture, then give you the title, but I'm going to give you the title first, and I want you to write it down, and you're going to just see how God unfolds it throughout this entire message here today, and it'll make sense to you. It may not make sense now, but it will. And here's the title, maybe is not an option. Maybe is not an option. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, do what you do. Take over this service, Holy Spirit. Father, it says in your word, when two or more are gathered in your name, great things will happen. So we pray that this is the year the Lord has made for the Houston Texans, and they're going to win that Super Bowl. They're going to make it happen. We declare and we believe, <laughs> and thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, come on, one more shout, amen, and put your hands together if you're ready for God's word. Maybe, maybe is not, is not an option. How many parents do I got in the house? Come on, wave at me. Where are you at? Where are your parents, okay? How many, how many dads, how many got daughters? Come on. Where are you at? Anybody got dads? Daughters? Okay. And so if we're just getting to know each other, to let you know that, uh, uh, I've been blessed, been married to my incredible wife, Kristen, for 19 years. Come on, somebody. And uh, we have, we have, we are blessed to have four kids, and three of them are girls. Now you know how to pray for a brother. And they're all 15 and under. Now you know how to fast and intercede for a brother. Come on, somebody. And, um, and uh, love my kids. They're absolutely amazing. And, but I'll never forget, I don't know why it hit me one morning. Maybe you were there for sure when you were young. And as a parent, it's probably crossed your mind, is that my daughter, my oldest daughter, Braylon, she was going into uh, middle school. And I don't know why it hit me one day. I'm like, oh, man, there's going to be some stuck on stupid boys. They're going to let my, my little girl know that, that, that she's pretty. And I'm like, man, first of all, I got to have a friend, so I got to have a little bad boys to life. You know what I'm saying? Like a little, like, we got to show up at a door. We got to do what we got to do. And, uh, and so, but uh, I'll never forget, it hit me one day. And I said, hey, baby girl, this is probably what's going to happen. Is you're going to be at school, you're going to be at lunch, you're going to be in the hallway, and then all of a sudden, somebody, a boy, is going to slide you a note. And on that note, it's going to say, hey, I like you. Do you like me? And I need you to check yes, no, or maybe. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about, right? Have you been there? And so I said, I said, Braylon, you got to hear me in this. I know I've never heard the true audible voice of God in my life except for one time. And this is that moment. And the Lord told me this is an easy answer. You check no every single time. Come on. And all the dads said amen, right? I'm like this is, there ain't no yes. There ain't no maybe. It's a no. Every time you ain't ready to date, I got to meet him. And then once I meet him, I'm going to scare him. And for another 20 years, he ain't going to come around. Come on. Anyways, but kid you not, like three weeks later, all of a sudden my daughter walks home and she, she ran in the door. She said, Dad, Dad, it happened. Oh, what are you talking about? She goes, I got a note. And she goes, and I checked maybe. I'm like, no. You missed the whole point. Then it was real simple. It was no. I'm like, who is he? Where does he live? Does he got a TikTok? Let me know. I'm about to find out. Come on. Do I got any dads in the house that are with me? And so I was just like, I was like, no. But I thought about that. I said, I said, hey, girl, I said, maybe it's not an option. When I think about this and when it comes to the Lord, I thought about this. If I were to slide a note to heaven and ask the Lord, how well am I living for you? Would he check yes? Would he check no? Or would he check Maybe. If I were to slide it to your best friend, to your spouse, your closest circle, 
And I said, hey, give me a good report. Do you want real accountability? If I were to slide them a note, how are they treating you at home? How well are they loving you? What is their walk with Jesus really like? Are they living for God? Where they check yes, where they check no, where they check maybe. Some of y'all tensing up right now. If y'all can see my, my view, just, just relax a little bit. Come on, y'all still love me? Come on, all right, all right. But I love you enough to challenge you to the places, I don't know about you, but for the Barbara household, for me and my house, I don't want there to be any question, whatever our room I walk into, no matter street corner that I go down, when somebody asks, does Brandon serve the Lord? It ain't a no, it definitely ain't a maybe, it is an absolute yes, Jesus is the center of his world and in his life. I'm not gonna get prideful about it. I'm not gonna stumble. I'm not saying I'm far from perfect, but I got anybody still under construction. Come on, I got anybody in the house? Just wave at me. Come on. 90% of y'all lying. Where you at? Come on, how many still get need some help? Where you at? Are you with me? So when I think about this, Think about maybe it's not an option. How well am I truly living for the Lord? In other words, am I so prideful to admit that I need help? And I want to break down our theme verse in James 4, verse 10. It says this, humble yourselves before the Lord. And what is that? And he will lift you. Up. How many thankful we serve a God who doesn't leave us where we are, right? He moves us from greater to greater. But he says, humble yourselves. In other words, if you want to write this down, the enemy of humility is pride. It says in Scripture that if you resist, God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but I don't want God resisting me on anything. But I'm also thankful for the grace of God. How many thankful for the grace of Jesus? Am I right? But he says he resists the proud. In other words, we, especially, I know me as a man, and we as people, we can get to the place where we get so prideful where we try to do it all on our own strength, right? And we forget that we need a Savior. Like, man, I got this. I can do this. And I know this from a little bit. I come from a sports ground. My father played here in the NFL. Y'all heard me talk about that. Here for the Houston Oilers. Come on, we're some Love You Blue fans in the house. Am I right? So I grew up, and I grew up in a sports world. I grew up as, a, as an athlete. I grew up as, as a quarterback. And I'm like, quarterback, I think I'm like, hey, give me the ball. Put it in my hands, coach. I'll carry the weight on the team. I got this. I can do this. I just grew up in that world, and, and I've tried to lead my, lead, my, lead my life that way in multiple ways and had to get some humility slapped in my face. And said, Yo, Brandon, as strong as you think you are, you ain't that strong, bro. Even my kids. I got to be honest with you, I got a nine-year-old son. I'll tell you if he's horrible, but he's a little baller. Come on. He talks about that. I got the drip. I got the drip, you know? And, uh, and so he is a, he's a little baller. But anybody else have a little cocky nine-year-old coin? Anybody else have like? <laughs> so it's okay to raise your hands in church. It's okay. It's a safe place. And so I'm like, man, you good, bro, but don't get so cocky. You got to remember there's somebody out there better than you, and his name is Dad. Come on, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> I got to humble my son real quick. He ain't got to win to nothing right now. In fact, it's going to be a long time until he wins and all the dads in the house go, yeah, come on. <laughs> we got to humble him. Sometimes we got to beat him. We got to make him cry, uh, beat him in a game, make him cry. And then we got to teach him humility. It's not perfect, but pray for me. I need help. <laughs> Are you with me though? When it comes to pride, in other words, get this. I'm setting this all up. The greatest act of humility is letting your pride die and accepting that you need help. Accepting that you need a savior. Because we don't like to admit that we're hurting. We don't like to admit that we need help. But a person who walks in true humility, you don't try to do it on your own strength, but you lean into the strength of the Lord and you realize that yes, I need help, and I need a Savior in my life. And then it goes on to say in James 4, it says, if you humble yourselves, he said, I will lift you up. Yeah. Lift me up from what? what? What does that mean, God? Your biggest prayer, your biggest answer. 
So here's what I want to, I want to break down to you is this. I believe that there's four valleys. And it's, it's in scripture. And I'm going to give it to you. Four valleys that the Bible talks about that every single one of us will walk through. It says in Psalms 23 verse 4, even when I walk through the darkest valley. Has anybody had a dark day? Come on, where you at? Show me your hands. Where you at? Does anybody have a dark season, a dark month, right? You've had a, you've had a dark moment. God said, you will walk through a dark valley. I will not be afraid. Why? Because you are Jesus. You are close beside me. It's him, right? You're going to walk through something that's going to challenge your pride to say, hey, I'm going to fix it on my own or I'm going to admit that I need help and I need a savior. And there's four valleys that each and every single one of us are going to walk through. I want to break them down here to you today because God didn't say, he said, he didn't say you're going to get stuck in the valley, did he? He said, you're going to get through the valley. How many are ready to get through to the other side of your breakthrough? Come on, anybody. So here's the first valley. I want you to write it down and we're going to break it down a little bit. It's the Valley of Achor, A-C-H-O-R. This valley, you can go back and you can study it. This valley is found in Joshua 7. It's also found in Hosea chapter 2. In Joshua 7, though, it says that it's a pla- this valley is a place of trouble. But in Hosea chapter 2, it calls it a place of hope. So which one is it? Which one is it? The first valley that will cause us to stumble is the valley of distraction. The valley of distraction. Joshua 7 says it's a valley of trouble. Hosea chapter 2 says it's a valley of hope. So which one is it? Which one is it, God? Maybe, just maybe, a place that God says is hope, the enemy is trying to distract you and tell you that it's trouble. Maybe an area that you think ain't trouble, God is trying to say, no, that actually is trouble. That ain't hope. The enemy will do everything it can to distract you to see the things differently than how God sees it in your life. The moment you see you the way that God created you, you won't be distracted by the opinions of others. And remember, you got a purpose before anybody had an opinion about you, right? Don't get distracted. First Chronicle, uh, first Corinthians 735 says this, and this I say to you for your own benefit. That I may not put you on a leash. In other words, I'm not trying to control you, the Lord says. But I want you to, uh, but for what is proper, that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Serve the Lord without distraction. There's multiple leaders in the Bible. The distraction caused them to miss out and see the good that God has had in their life. Even in Joshua chapter 7, if you go and you read it, Joshua was on mission. He was running in his purpose. And it says in Scripture that he experienced trouble. In other words, he began to just kind of knock his focus off on God's calling. He began keeping his eyes more on the pain instead of the promise. Has anybody ever had days where you focus more on the negative than the positive? In other words, maybe it's a distraction of the enemy to get you to take your eyes off the goodness of God. Let me tell you right now, you might have had a bad year, but if you go back and you journal the bad days and the good days, I guarantee you're going to see you've had way more good days than you've had bad days. You just don't get distracted from what the enemy is trying to magnify that is bad that God said is good. We see this with Joshua. We see this in the story with Mary and Martha. Mary was at the feet of Jesus, but the Bible says that Martha was in the house and working. She thought that it was her good works that was going to get her love from Jesus. She thought it was her good works that was going to get her into the kingdom of heaven. But can I tell you right now, it's not just being a good boy or a good girl or doing good things that's going to get you to heaven. Some good things doesn't mean it's a God thing. And it's not good works They're going to get you to heaven by doing good things. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the center of your world. He's the center of your everything. I know a lot of people that make good decisions. They're good people. But Jesus is not the Lord of their life. 
You can get distracted on saying, man, I'm doing this, I'm doing this good, I'm doing this good, but totally miss heaven completely. I look at Samson, a man who was strong, a man who was prideful. Every time he came to fight, it said the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. But not once did he pray for the Spirit of the Lord come upon him, and he got distracted with wrong relationships. In other words, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And who you hang around is who you're going to become. I know real quick, when I talk to young people, I'm like, yo, who you following right now on social? Who are your friends? Because who you put your circle around is the direction that you're heading. I don't know about you, but I don't need people in my life pulling me away from Jesus. I need people in my life pointing me stronger to Jesus. I don't need the distractions of others. As long as I'm leaning in to the Lord. And Samson, even in his last moments, asked God's presence to come on him. Because how many know God is always there in a moment, right? Look at King David. King David was a man who was a, he was a powerful leader, great man. He was a soldier. He went out and he fought in the battlefield. He would win. He would fight for people and he would fight for the Lord. But then all of a sudden, there was a season in his life where he didn't go out. The Bible says he would go in and out to the battlefield and in the presence of God. But then there was a season where all of a sudden, the Bible says he stayed in the palace. David never got in trouble when he was in the battlefield. He only got in trouble when he stayed in the palace and he got comfortable. Don't get so comfortable inside the blessings of God in your life. I'm telling you right now, how many want to be blessed? Come on, show of hands. Where you at? God wants to bless you. God wants to heal you. How many believe your best days are ahead of you? Am I right? Your best days are ahead of you, but don't get so comfortable within your blessing. God didn't heal you for you to slow down. God healed you and blessed you for you to run stronger and for you to run greater in everything that he has called you to do. Don't be blessed and then sit back, but man, say, God, thank you for this. Don't get distracted. God will bless you but he's blessing you with the purpose. Everything that you have, God give it to you to help people and to help others and to help his church. Come on, y'all. Y'all still love me? Come on, y'all with me, all right? Don't get, don't get distracted because the enemy, uh, I, I believe this wholeheartedly. I believe the distraction is a strategy of the enemy more than we even realize. Because if God can get you to accept what is good and it's not God, then he's distracted you. He's saying, I, I just, I, God wants to speak to you. There's some of you that you, we were so busy and life is so busy. God has blessed you and done some good things in your life that you're believing God for some direction and you're so busy, you can't even get direction. You can't hear the voice of God in your life. You're so distracted by everything that is happening. You're trying to get an answer from the Lord, but you're not even sitting still enough to hear it. You know, I got, do I got anybody? Show, show my hands real quick. How many got on a, uh, a computer, a PC? Come on, PC computer. Where you at? Okay. And where's my God's people? You got an Apple computer. Come on, where you at? Okay. Okay. <laughs> if you got an Apple computer, have you ever had that one time where there, there's this little thing that popped up on the top right, and it says, hey, an update is available, and it gives you two options. It says you can either install now or later. remind me later. How many would be honest in the house, right? How many would agree? You've hit remind me later so many times. Come on, don't lie in church. Right? I just thought about this. I wonder how many times God is trying to do an update in your life. And you too busy to hit install now, but you hit remind me later because I'm too busy with this business deal. I'm too busy doing this. I'm too busy to come to church. I'm too busy to get plugged in. I'm too busy to God. And your answer, you could have had three weeks ago, but you got distracted by everything. Oh, come on. I'm preaching way better than you shouting. Sometimes we need to pause because God is trying to update your marriage, but you've done nothing to pause and work on your marriage. You would rather quit than work on it. Don't get distracted by the pain and the wrongdoings, but lean into the Lord. And I'm telling you right now, if you get away from the distraction and you lean in the Holy Spirit, you will not stumble. 
But God wants to do an update in your life. How many believe in Jesus' name your miracle is on the way? Come on, you believe it? How many believe your breakthrough is on the way? Somebody shout, I'm blessed. Because it's coming. Why? He's a good God. And blessing you is not an option for him. Maybe it's not an option when it comes to blessing you. He's never been distracted about you, so stop being distracted about him. Yo, I'm coming right at y'all. Y'all good? Come on. All right. It's week one, baby. Come on. First valley that will cause us to stumble is the valley of distraction. Here's the second one for taking notes. Is this. Is the valley of Kidron. K-I-D-R-O-N. I know it sounds like a transformer. <laughs> valley of Kidron. You can go back and you can study it. You can find this in John chapter 18 in the Bible. This is pretty powerful, though. This is the valley that Jesus traveled through to heal Lazarus. Because how many know we don't just serve a God who makes bad things good. We serve a God who takes dead things and turn them into life again. Come on, am I right? That's how good he is. This is the valley that Jesus went through when he left the Last Supper and he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, the moments before he went to the cross. This is the valley that David escaped his family because they were trying to kill him. Anybody got some crazy family? Come on, where you at? I didn't say look at him in the room, all right? We got some crazy, we, everybody's got a crazy Uncle Eddie, come on. I want you to write this down though. The Hebrew word for Kidron is this, it's Kordah, K-O-R-D-A-H. Here's what it means. It means heavy. It means sad. It means mourn. Hello. It means, amen. It means, <laughs> yes, Lord. <laughs> it means it means mourning. Here's the second valley, second valley that will cause you to stumble, and it's the valley of hurt. Being stuck in hurt and unforgiveness. And I know we hurting right now because our Astros need some help, Jesus. <laughs> but we're gonna pray. Come on, how we know he's the God of the comeback. Hey. It's not how we start, it's how we finish. But I know this, if we get real, and a lot of my friends that just went through freedom, they know this. Come on, how many were set free from some hurt and some unforgiveness in their life? And if God can do it for them, how many know God can do it for you, right? But some of you, you've held on to hurt, because hurt people hurt people. We live in a broken world. People will hurt you. Circumstances will happen. Storms will take place. But you're mad and you're hurting because something happened to you or somebody treated you a certain way and it's, it's drowning your joy and it's drowning your hope. You got this bitterness and unforgiveness that is rising up in your heart. And can I tell you, I know it's not easy to let it go, but you got to let it go because maybe holding on to it is not an option. Not if you want healing in your soul, not if you want healing in your life. And can I tell you, the greatest of leaders in the Bible struggled with this. There's a conversation with Peter and Jesus. I think Peter was a pretty great leader, wouldn't you agree? He helped start the local church after Jesus went on to heaven. I'm thankful for Peter. But even Peter had a conversation with Jesus in Matthew 18, and it says, Then Peter came to him, and he asked, Lord, how often should I forgive somebody? Because people are stupid. They hurt me. He goes, seven times? Is that all I got to do? I can do seven, Jesus. But Jesus challenged him. He said, no, nah, no, Peter, not seven times. But what? Seventy times seven. You got to get rid of this unforgiveness or you'll be stuck you will stumble in this valley, and I'm trying to get you to the mountaintop, Peter. I'm trying to get you to greater things. And I don't know about you, but I, I've been in moments in my life where I've just been mad at somebody. I remember this one dude. Come on, anybody ever been mad at somebody? Come on. Come on, yo, man, come on don't lie. I ain't talking about valley of lying. Come on, where you at? You've been, I'm in like mad at somebody. 
And I don't know about y'all, like, please pray for me. Like, I know I'm saved, I'm a pastor, but I will lay the hands on Jesus so, real quick on somebody. Like, and I believe in healing. I'm like, like I, still, I still need, I need, I need a little help, I mean. And, uh, and so I'll, I'll, never forget, I'll never forget this one time I was inside. Uh, my family and I, we were, I'm sorry, I'm giggling about it already before telling the story. Is that, is that uh, my family and I, if you didn't know, we do, we do prison ministry. And we've been doing it for 40 years, now going into the prisons. Come on, somebody, right? All over America and all over the world. And Pastor Daniel mentioned last week where we celebrated 406 baptisms. Come on, somebody. Inside the prison, over 650 gave their life to Jesus. Come on. Saying, hey, they might be in prison, but prison don't have to be on the inside of them. Come on. Tell you right now, God is good in that. But I'll never forget going inside of a prison. I was just walking in one time, and this dude just walked right up to me. Whoa! And he said, yo, you the preacher, man? I'm like, yeah. He said, so if I hit you, you going to turn the other cheek? I said, no, bro. I ain't read that far in the Bible yet. Bring your best shot. Let's go. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Y'all, I told you, y'all got to pray for a brother. Come on, like. Like, I might be that dad, this guy, I'm coaching my son and my kid. I might have been thrown out of the game. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I wasn't wearing any Hope City merch, so, so we good. Like, like we, we all right. <laughs> you just been, there's been those moments. Come on, am I relating to anybody? Like, you want to like, Jesus, stay right here for five minutes. I'll be right back, because that's all it's going to take. I remember being mad at this dude one time, and just a bitterness. Just anger. Just like, ha. Like, and all of a sudden, I'm sitting there. It's like in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and I'm replaying in my head everything I'm going to say to him. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that. Anybody ever had the best argument in your mind? When, and it's like, like, I mean, you didn't miss a beat. I'm going to say, I'm gonna say this. if he says this, I'm going to come around here. And I'm, like, and I'm just like, let's go. Remember a man just getting so mad, so angry. And I think the Holy Spirit and the Lord just got tired of arguing with me. And about 3 a.m., I literally, I felt it in my soul. I heard the Holy Spirit and I heard the Lord say, forgive him. And I literally got so mad because, you know, sometimes God don't know all the details. And I literally started debating with the Lord like, yeah, but he did this, he did that, he did. I said, I, I call myself, Lord, like, he's wrong. And here's what the Lord said. Of course he's wrong. You don't forgive somebody who's right. Oh, come on, Hope City. Where you at? Am I talking? Because the reason why you haven't forgiven somebody ain't their fault. It's on you. It's your heart. It's your soul. You're the only one in control of your forgiveness in your heart and your soul. And the Bible says that when he, we give our life to Jesus, am I right? He says he for gives us of our sins. He washes our sins away as far as the east is to the west. And I remember the Lord saying one day, Brandon, if, you're not, uh, if I'm not thinking about it anymore, why are you still thinking about it? And I thought about that because I tell you right now, can I be honest with you? If it still crosses your mind or the Bible says out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. If it's still in your language, you can say you have forgiven them all day long, but you're still stuck and the valley of unforgiveness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I tell you right now, though, don't be stuck in the valley of hurt. Release and let it go today. Let him go. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your family member. Maybe it's a father or a mother. Maybe it's a business partner. Maybe it's a friend. Can I tell you right now, only you can keep you stuck. Come on, am I talking to anybody today? God says, I want to get you through the valley. because If you humble yourself enough, if you humble yourself enough to realize you need help and that you can get better, how many of you know greater things are in store for you? Come on, can I get an amen on all that? Psalms 84 verse 6 says this, when they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become, here's the promise of God, a refreshing spring and you will grow stronger. It's a beautiful picture, right? Here's the third valley. Here's the third valley. We'll begin to move quickly. Third valley that will cause you to stumble. And that's this. It's the valley, the valley of dryness. The valley of dryness. You don't know the story in Ezekiel 37. You can go back and study it. 
But it says, the Lord took hold of me. How many thankful that the Lord holds on to us? Come on, am I right? Even when we let go of him at times. He said, I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with dry bones. He led me all around among the bones, and they covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground, and they were completely dried out. When I say the valley of dryness, here's what I'm talking about. We need to get honest. We're talking about humility, right? As we've all hit that place, or you might be at that place where you're living a life where it's, it's the dryness of spirit. In other words, anybody ever had cotton mouth? Like, and right, it's just like the worst. There's a cotton mouth of the soul. And all of a sudden, when you stop worshiping like the way you used to worship, when you stop reading God's word the way you used to read God's word, there was a day where you were consistent coming to church every single week because you could not wait to get into the house of God. Where the average nowadays, most people come to church once every six weeks. I don't know about you, but to me, I'm like, I, when I'm not in the house of God, dryness begins to fall in my life. And I don't know about you, but I want a fresh spirit. I want a fresh wind. I want a fresh move of the Holy God. And I get that by being in the house of the Lord. I want to ask you this. Do you remember that first time? Just take a moment. When you first, when you first met Jesus? You remember that moment when you first felt God's presence? Some of you, you haven't felt it in a long time. And can I tell you, right there at the very end of worship, when Rodney and the team was going in just a little bit more, by the way, time was up, but the Holy Spirit was moving in that moment. And what you felt in your spirit and in your soul, leap. God is saying, I missed that. I want more of that. And the only way you get that is by hanging out more with Jesus and in his presence. I see people, you go and you can search, and I watch videos from underground churches around the world, and they just get, they have to smuggle in Bibles. They smuggle in Bibles just to get one sheet of paper every single week, and they're weeping, and they're rejoicing because, my God, I got a piece of God's Word, and we struggle with they even opening up our book to read the Psalms every single day. Come on, Joe, hear me. I'm trying to stir your heart a little bit because if you need breakthrough in your life, there's probably some dryness and God is saying, hey, I'm ready for you to get back to being the worshiper that I know you're supposed to be, to loving God the way you're supposed to be, that when you come into church, we shouldn't have to tell you to throw up your hands, but there's something on the inside of you you can't help but worship God when you walk into his presence. Because if you ever meet somebody with a fresh spirit, if you ever meet somebody with a fresh spirit, you will realize, my God, it's amazing. Man, the way they worship, the way that they love people, the way that they serve, how they live their life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because you probably remember yourself. Let me tell you right now, that's why we say all the time, and I've heard our pastor say, man, man, don't ever, don't ever judge somebody's praise when you don't know their background. Because let me tell you right now, you don't know everybody's background. You see people coming up in here, which I love about our church. We're going to shout. We're going to jump. Some of you stand right here. I'm just waiting on somebody to take a lap someday, baby. Bring us to church. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like are you with me? Like, don't judge them. Because let me tell you right now, if God sets you free from cancer, you be shouting. You be jumping. If God sets you free from diabetes, you be shouting. You be shouting. Oh, come on, old city. If God sets you free from addiction, you be taking a lap. You would be having freedom. You would be shouting. You don't know my story, but what God has done for me. You got to get this, man. What God done for me, worshiping him, it is not an option. Shouting and praising is not an option. I tried to live life dry, but I don't want to be dry anymore because I need the Spirit of God. Come on, are you with me, man? I need the Spirit of God in my, in my life. Man, I'm running out of time. Let's go. Here's my last, here's my last valley for you. Here's my last valley. Let me just say something on that last point. I'm going to ask you to find humility and ask yourself, where's the place where you know 
you can grow more. Maybe it's your worship. Maybe it's your word. Maybe there was a used, used to be a day when you came to the house of God and you threw up hands. Now you walk in, third song in. God is saying, I'm ready for you to get back to who I've called you to be. I promise, y'all still love me? I promise, okay? Y'all, I like I love y'all. Here we go, last, last valley. How many glad you came to church today? Come on, anybody? Glad? Come on, here we go, here we go, here we go. Valley number four. Valley number four that will cause us to stumble is the valley of Jehoshaphat. Joel 3 verse 12 says this. Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Verse 14 though, check it out. Multitudes and multitudes are in the valley of, shout it out, decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Here's the last valley that will stall and cause you to stumble. It's the valley of decision. The valley of decision. I'm not talking about trying to decide where to eat. My God, how many feel like you in a valley with your spouse every time trying to decide to go eat? (laughs) What are we gonna watch on Netflix? I don't know. Just decide. Find freedom. It's the valley of decision. But here, lean in, please, please. Here's what I'm talking about. Here's what the Bible's speaking to. The valley of decision is choosing to live a life double-minded. The Bible says a double-minded man will fall. In other words, you know, you're unsure on what you believe. You're living life where you got one foot in Jesus and one foot in the world. You live in a life where you're picking and choosing the Bible the way you want to live and to fit your lifestyle. Instead of going all in with Jesus, we're like, like man, there's, there's multiple ways to heaven. No, can I tell you, there's one way. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. There's one way. This is not a double-minded thing. It's a Jesus thing. In fact, in 1 Kings 18, here's the challenge. From Elijah, he says this, Elijah Challenge the people. How long are you going to sit on the fence? If God is real, follow him. If it's Baal, follow him. But make up your mind. Don't just talk like you love Jesus. And your walk don't match it. We see you at your best right here. But your family knows who you really are. And I love you enough to let you know I see too many people living life and double-minded. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to believe this way. I'm going to believe that way. No, we're going to believe, I'm going to believe this scripture. I'm not going to believe that scripture. They're double-minded. They're confused about their identity. They're confused about who they are. Can I tell you right now? God don't make mistakes. He created you exactly who you're meant to be and exactly who you are. Stop living life so double-minded. It's simple. It's Jesus. He's the way. Maybe it's not an option. It's not an option. God wants to love you right where you are. No matter your story, no matter your circumstance, no matter what you're walking through, God is saying, hey, maybe it's never been an option for me to love you. Why are you making an an option to love me? I want to finish with the story because this whole series is talking about living a life of humility because we all got pride in our life to admitting that you need a savior and you can't do it on your own strength. I was reminded, I'm going to close with this. As you know, every pastor has at least three closings. Come on, somebody, right? But a friend of mine, of course, being in prison ministry, I met a good friend. I've met a lot of, have a lot of dear friends that are in prison. This one time, the state of Texas called. 
there's this prison called the Telford Unit and it's near Texarkana area. And we walked in as that time, this is about five years ago, it was the most violent prison in the state of Texas. And they said, man, we can't calm this place down. And they literally called the head of the state and said, the only people that can calm this place down is the Barbara Family Prison Ministry, which by the way, is the Hope City Prison Ministry. Come on, somebody. The state is calling us to go make a difference in the prisons. So I get there and I walk in and me and dad had multiple revival services, walked every square inch of that prison. They led us into places they don't let anybody go. I'll never forget, I'm walking down the hall and I see my friend, Tony. Never forget him. My dude, Tony, is seven foot two. Let me tell you right now, I ain't never been intimidated by a man in my life. But, but Tony got my attention. My boy, Tony, is actually one of the top five most violent inmates in the history of the Texas prison system. He's 47 years old. He's been in there for multiple years. He's got a learning disability and he's got a fifth grade or fourth grade education. Sometimes he just moves a little bit slower, but because of that, guys make fun of him all the time and do things. I mean, he was so raw, he didn't know his own strength. He took out 10 to 15 full tactical guards inside the prison. I mean, you could just see it like in his eyes, like full of anger, just like, and just full of like, like, like I'm going to do this my way. And Long story short, we end up having a service that night. We have a service that night, and inside this service is a little bit, uh, it's not really normal, it doesn't happen all the time, but it was a special time. There was 300 prisoners inside this service, and inside this service was every single gang leader, the head of all the, the, the atheists were in there, the head of the atheist movement, the head of the Satanist church, and all his church members were in this movement, and the worst of the worst inside of the prison were inside of there, and there was one guard. Come on, somebody. But if you, if you know me, I live for this moment. To tell people about Jesus, like, it's just like, it's what I love. But I'll never forget, Holy Spirit moved in that moment. Might have even been talking about maybe it's not an option. Now, I'm afraid, cool story. At the very end, I had the head of the Satanist church walk up to me, and I still got a picture of it, and I have it at my house. He gave me an upside down cross. He said, I now know who the true Savior is, and I gave my life to Jesus tonight, and it started a movement in the entire prison. Come on. But you have that setting, and it's like intense. And then guess who comes walking in the door? My boy, Tony. I'm like, oh, Jesus. And after service, have a little bit of prayer time. My boy, Tony, and he's, he's like a little kid, seven foot two, 47 years old. He knows no boundaries. He walks right up to me. <laughs> I'm looking up at him. He's looking down at me. Like, what up, Tony? He's like, yeah. He's looking down at me. He said, hey. He said, I'm a little slow and people make fun of me. When they make fun of me, I beat them up. I'm like, you smart, Tony. I just want you to know, you smart. I don't know what they think, but I just want you to know what I think, Tony. It's a true story. He said, I either beat them up or I cut myself. Imagine a seven foot two man with depression and anxiety. And... But tears begin to come down his eyes. He said, I realized tonight I've been battling just double minded. Does God love me? Does not love me? Is, 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 maybe God loves me. Maybe he doesn't love me. He said at seven years old, he was abused and molested. It was from a church leader. From seven years old, he's hated God. He said, I hated every person that even loved the Lord. And here, 40 years later, he's inside the depth of a prison, and the world says it's over. God uses a moment to lead him back to Jesus. And that night he gave his life to the Lord, which is an incredible story in itself. But here's what I want you to get. Here's what I want you to get. Because after that, we went into the office with him, me and my father. He said, hey, Mr. Barber. He said, hey, hey, can I sing you a song? I'm like, yeah, Tony, you seven foot two. You can do whatever you want, man. 
say, will you sing me a song? And I will never forget it. He had one of the most beautiful voices I've ever said in my life. He said, I wrote this song at seven years old. And the name of that song was this, Why I Need You, God. And I looked at him and I said, you see, Tony, maybe was never an option for God to stop loving you. It's time that you stop making an option to love him. And can I tell you right now, I said, hey, maybe you gave up on God at seven, but God never gave up on you at seven. He never gave up on you at 17 or 27 or 37 or 47. Oh, come on, Old City. How many thankful that we serve a God who loves us right where we are, no matter if we stumble, no matter if we mess up, but if we just come to him, everything will turn around. Can I tell you, maybe is not an option. Not an option. Stay standing as we close. Because I know this. Everybody stand with me. Don't leave. There's no good in here in the whole service. Man, we on the fourth quarter, baby. One yard line. We're about to finish this thing. Because I know this. I got some friends in the room and watching right now and at every campus and watching online. That you've been caught in a valley. Whether it's distraction that doesn't need to be a part of your life anymore. You're dealing with some hurt and you need to let it go. You've been dry and you need the Spirit of God alive in your life again. Or maybe you've been caught in the valley of decision. Maybe it doesn't need to be an option for you anymore. Because I say it every week. Jesus didn't die on the cross to be a part of your top three. He died to be number one in your life. My question to you today is are you going to let pride hold you back from responding? because of those who are around you? Man, I wonder what they're going to think. I don't, I don't know what they're going to say. No, 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 no. I mean, like we say, we're family around here. Just like Jesus kept loving my friend Tony, how I many know Jesus loves us right where we are? So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't want you to miss this moment. And I want to say it again. Maybe was never an option for God loving you. He's just waiting on you. So whether you're here and it's your very first time, you need to rededicate your life. You've been hearing what I'm talking about. Maybe you've been dealing with pain. Maybe you've been distracted by the things of this world. And I don't need to break it down to you. You know what's wrong and you know what's right. There's some things you need to let go of. There's some people you need to let go of. And let me tell you right now, if you lose friends but you gain Jesus, you still gain everything. And you're here tonight, there's some of you, for the first time, in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to have you shoot your hand up. We can throw our hands up at a football game or a basketball game, lose our voice and lose our minds. But we get quiet in the house of God, and I'm challenging that. And I'm asking you, in just a moment, you're going to raise your hand if if I'm talking to you. But number one, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus for the first time, now's the moment. Or maybe you need to rededicate your life. Maybe it's time to bring him. You've been so much in the valley of decision. You've been picking and choosing with God, and God is saying, hey, I picked you a long time ago. It's time for you to make me your number one draft pick. You need to rededicate your life. You need to do it for you. You need to do it for your marriage, for your family. You need to do it for your friends. So here on the count of three, if I'm talking to you, I'm going to ask you to throw your hand up. You're saying me. Hands are already going up. Ready? One, two, three. Come on. Everybody, throw it up. Throw it up. Keep it up. Come on. Keep it up. Keep it up. Come on. Keep it up. Keep it up. Come on. If you're watching online, come on. Just type Jesus in the chat. Come on. Every campus. Where you at, Woodlands? Come on. Where you at, Katie? Come on. Keep your hands up. Come on. I want to see us. Come on. We can celebrate this, Hope City. The Bible says when one comes to heaven, all the heaven throws a party. Yeah. Come on, everybody, throw your hands up with them. Come on, everybody, throw your hands up. Hands went up all over the building. Come on, everybody, look up to the ceiling. Look up to heaven. Shout this prayer. Everybody shout, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, Jesus, I give you my life. Wash my sins clean. Make me new. Make me whole. Serving you 
It's not an option for me anymore. Today, I give you my life. And in Jesus' name, if you believe that, Hope City, I know we shouted a lot, but I need it one more time. Come on, somebody give God some praise in the house. Yeah!